Welcome to Wildemar Beach Congregational Church. I'm Mary Claire Hansen. The weather is very fickle. What a beautiful day today after yesterday. So glad to see everybody here. Only two weeks till Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We're so excited. Next week is the premiere of our mini musical, Amazing Love. Invite all your friends and family. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event, and we're looking forward to everybody being here. A few announcements. Our prayer list for this week, please pay attention for members and friends of this congregation, but especially for our good friend Anthony, who just walked in. Anthony's getting his hip surgery tomorrow, so we need to pray over him after service. So... Uh, Everybody, uh, please keep Anthony in your prayers tomorrow morning. Um, the deacons meeting immediately following the service today. Karen, when do the items need to be here for the Easter baskets? Okay, the baskets will be filled for families in need on Saturday, April 1st. So make sure your items are here. If you can't get them here and you need some, one of us to pick them up, please contact me um, or Karen. Um, I don't know who might be else be available to pick up food, Lori. Um, so uh, just uh, if you signed up, please make sure your item is here by next Saturday. Or you could just bring it next Saturday when they're ready to fill. Um, we're continuing our Bible study in the book of Revelation this week. Um, the following week, whoops, careful, we lost one here. <laughs> Stand up. Okay, he's back. Okay. Um, I forgot where I left off. <laughs> oh, so no, I was talking about on our uh, uh, Bible study. We will not have Bible study the Wednesday before Easter um, uh, because we have Monday, Thursday service that week. So just a, 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 to let you know about that. The Easter egg hunt is next Saturday. We need lots of volunteers. Paula, what time do we want the volunteers here? We we need the men. We we need the we need the men here by eight o'clock to set up the tents, and then uh, we still have to put all the eggs out on the lawn between eight and nine. Yep, popcorn machine, coffee. We need lots of help, especially since this postcard did drop. I got mine this week. I don't know if anybody else got one in the mail this week. Um, so we might have more people. Um, than normal for our neighborhood hunt. So um, we really would appreciate anybody who could give us help that day. The event begins for the hunt at 11 o'clock. Um, Paula is the most organized person in regard to this event. So um, we look forward to her leadership for next Saturday. Um, and uh, again, please pay attention to all the Holy Week services coming up in your bulletin. The flower orders are due today. If you wanted to order flowers for the Easter service, they'll be here for Palm Sunday. Tulips or daffodils, $9 each, Paula. Um, yep, so just put, um, if you want it in honor or memory of a family member, just put it in the uh, collection plate today. Um, today is the last day to order them. $9 each, right, Paula? Okay. Um, last but not least, Anniversaries and birthdays. Linda and Joe Whalen have an anniversary tomorrow. How many years, guys? 58. 58? Wow. 58 years. Wonderful. And we have uh, four birthdays this week. Megan Murray. That's Karen and Peter's daughter. And we have three gentlemen in this church who have the same birthday this week. Clint LaPlante. Dave Leonard and Dave Rossman all have the same birthday this week. So happy birthday to the three of them. So, yep. so, okay. 
Are there any other announcements this morning? Lori. Tom and I had an anniversary on Friday, and it was 22 years. Wow. wow. Happy anniversary. <laughs> any other announcements? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Now you're all awake. It's good to be here this morning, and if you would join me in the call to worship as you all stand. Friends in Christ, we are gathered to give thanks for all we have received from God's good hands. Let us draw near to God in all humility and celebrate God's infinite goodness and mercy. We're going to sing hymn 617. I would believe the words are printed here. me in the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, we come seeking you in the midst of our joy and our brokenness as individuals and as a community. Move along among us during this hour of worship. By the power of your Holy Spirit, turn us from our foolishness to your truth in our thoughts, prayers, and songs and in all our living. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. And now please join me in the prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered away from your way. We have done wrong and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth the fruit of the Spirit that we may live as disciples of Christ. Hear now our silent confessions for the sins which we commit and fail to honestly recognize.
Lord God, we thank you for the sun that is shining outside, the beautiful day that it is. Thank you for the rain yesterday. We always need the rain, but we thank you for the sunshine today. As we gather in your name to worship, we pray that you might enable us by your spirit to do so in ways pleasing and honoring to you, encouraging, uplifting to each one gathered, as well as others who are joining us by the live stream. So, as we begin our service, we always pause for a time of reflection and confession. We ask for a complete cleansing of all of our sins, omission as well as omission. And we ask as well for a refilling of your spirit. As leaky vessels, we pray that we might be full of your spirit today in the service to worship you and then to leave to serve you this week and bring honor and glory to your name and for the kingdom. We ask and pray these things. Uh, Mary Claire mentioned if you got your postcard that's if you live here in this part of Milford from the Audubon Center up to the park out to Route 1 basically is uh, our Jerusalem and we mailed this to 5,257 homes <laughs> 10 to 15,000 people so get ready for a crowd next week <laughs> starting with the egg hunt starting with the egg hunt and uh, also for the mini musical. Now, I suggest you want to come early for a good seat next week. And remember, we always double park where the hedge is at. So pull up to or back up to the hedge. And if you're going to be here for the for a while, <laughs> you're going to stay for the feed. <laughs> uh, that we double park over there. And uh, we also, I think, are going to have some help with uh, parking next week. So uh, be ready to make some new friends. You know, your best friend was once a complete stranger, right? So make new friends, but keep the old, the newer silver, the older gold, right? So <laughs> chance to make some new friends next week. Uh, we have uh, all the different services going on. This is the first we've done something like this. And um, it's going to be a uh, wonderful uh, Lent, end of Lent, Holy Week, and uh, Easter services. We'll pray for some good weather next Saturday and Sunday, and especially as well for Easter Sunday also. Um, we got some devotionals for Easter that have come in, 10 reflections from daily preference. And daily. Sort of matches our uh, postcard, does it not? I think got a theme here, Dave. You got a theme. So um, don't forget uh, that. So um, we got that little love note from the finance committee about Easter. And uh, you know what that means? It means to uh, bring your uh, jars of coins, those of you that are, have that as your uh, collection. And remember, anonymous nickels, <laughs> I'm bringing mine next week. So Dan... We'll have to make some arrangements here. Okay. All right. Okay. We continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Also, the uh, Easter flowers uh, note uh, that you have as well if you want to participate with that.
I guess so. You're it. <laughs> it's a busy morning for me today. My need I now confess No friend like him In times of deep distress I need Jesus The need I gladly own Though some may bear their load alone Yet I need Jesus, I need Jesus, I need Jesus, I need Jesus every day. Need him in the sunshine hour, need him when the storm clouds lower, Every day along my way, yes, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need a friend like him, a friend to guide when paths of life are dim. I need Jesus when foes my soul assail. Alone I know I can but fail, so I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Jesus every day. Need him in the sunshine hour. Need him when the storm clouds lower. Every day along my way, yes, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need him to the end, no one like him, he is the sinner's friend. I need Jesus, no other friend will do, so constant, kind, so strong and true, yes, I need Jesus, I need Jesus with me. I need Jesus, will we? I need Jesus every day, every day. Need him in the sunshine hour. Need him when the storm clouds hoar. Every day along my way, yes, I need Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. All right. So I hope you don't mind if we uh, chimed in on there with you. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the children are making their departure. That was one of those toe-tapping songs. It was. And for some reason or other, I remember Mr. Stauffer, our oh. orchestra director, teaching us to tap your toe inside your shoe. I hadn't thought about that in many years. <laughs> Tapping toe inside the shoe. Yes, please do. Okay. Okay, please do. Making you work double overtime. Yeah, it's 
lot of other things going on here. I but, gave you a little um, break there. Let give you a little break. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna read from the book of Luke and the eleventh chapter, and we're gonna read verses fourteen through twenty-eight. <clears throat> now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, kept demanding from him a sign from heaven. But he knew what they were thinking and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself becomes a desert, and house falls on house. (laughs) If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out the demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I cast out the demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his castle... His property is safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he is trusted and divides his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions looking for a resting place, but not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. While he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. But he said, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. May God add his blessing to this reading. Okay, Dan, you can uh, rest a bit now. Taking a break. Don't get too comfortable. Oh, gee. So, we are in the parable series, as you know. We have one more. Next week will be the last in this series. Today is number 35. There's something like 40 different parables, but a couple of the smaller parables you remember I put together. Now, I consider the parable that we're looking at today to be a parable, but I have to tell you there are some commentators that don't see it as a parable. I don't know what they see it as, an illustration or whatever else, but one of the uh, best commentators, uh, Hiram Eers, uh also, as I do, considered a parable, so I'm including this in my, my series on the parables. Today, it's the parable of the empty house or the haunted house, or another subphrase, the man is worse than the first. That man is worse than the first. Recorded in Matthew as well as in Luke, the passage that uh, Dan read for our scripture reading this morning. So, I don't think this is just a real-life story, although the truth of it uh, is certainly uh, true. I think Jesus, in telling this story, was illustrating a very simple fact. Simply removing something bad or evil and not filling the space with good creates a vacuum that can lead to a worse situation than before. I'll read that again. A simple fact. Simply removing an evil or bad and not filling the space with good creates a vacuum which can lead to a worse situation than before, as Jesus said, worse than the first. So let's examine the parable, the story as told by Jesus. I'm using Matthew's account, Matthew 12 Verse 43 to 45. When an evil spirit, a demon, comes out of a man, it goes through an arid or 
desert places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house or the residence that he had left. When it arrives, he finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes or brings with it seven other spirits, evil demons, more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. The final condition of that man is worse than the first. Jesus said, this is how it will be with that generation. And the context in Matthew's account was there were those that uh, were asking for a sign from Jesus. Jesus having power over over demons, Jesus apparently was using that as an illustration of a sign if they were really looking for a sign. So that's the passage right before. A wicked and generous adulterer, a, gener a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. And then Jesus told this story about the evil spirit. The evil spirit, he says, comes out of a man. Doesn't say how or what caused it or why the evil spirit leaves. Now we know that Jesus was a healer. And one of the things that Jesus did was heal people from demonic possession, demon-possessed. There are numerous accounts in the New Testament. You remember the story about the man over there in the Gadardines on the eastern slope uh, side of the Sea of Galilee. There's a slope, and Jesus cast the demons out. They went into the swine. The swine all ran down the slope into the lake, drowned. Some people were not happy with that. The people that owned the pigs were not happy with that. And even though this man was delivered from demonic possession who had been a trouble to them, um, when you affect people's pocketbooks, you generally hear from them, right? <laughs> they weren't so happy. So they're asking Jesus to leave. And the man wanted to go with Jesus also. But Jesus said, no, you go back to your town and you go give witness to the glory of God, the power of God. So keep in mind that... Uh, what we're reading here in the New Testament was 2,000 years ago. There's a very fine line between demonic possession and mental illness. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. Sometimes mental illness could be caused perhaps by an evil spirit, but not necessarily all the times. Now I've had in my 50 years of ministry a little experience with some of both. And I find that one of the most important things when attempting to relate and help individuals in those conditions is to do a little research with them about things that have happened beforehand and what history there might be. If there's a history of mental illness or if uh, there's some exposure to uh, something demonic or Satan. I remember uh, one individual uh, he started renting out one of his rooms to a guy, and the guy showed up with a Buddha. He didn't think anything. He just thought it was kind of like a art object. Well, this person was really into that. And uh, that evil spirit started to cause problems even with that individual. So uh, something as innocent as a little statue, you might say, well, it could be, well, depending upon what people associate give credit to, power to, uh, apparently had some things. So um, demonic possession, mental illness, fine line between both, but uh, doing a little investigation into people's backgrounds, you can perhaps ascertain 
what the cause is. Now, Jesus, Jesus is indeed, you need Jesus, everybody needs Jesus. Jesus is the name that is above all names. Jesus is the name above all names, and that includes mental illness, and that includes demonic possession. The power of Jesus over Satan. Jesus, in that situation you were reading, he gives that as an example. If you're looking for a sign, see me casting out demons, uh, must have power, supernatural power to be able to do that. He has power over both situations that can bring about healing. So it says the evil spirit leaves. It departs, seeking rest from a lot of times in demonic possession, there's this frenetic activity. And so this uh, wild evil spirit leaves and goes looking for a place to find rest, but only encounters an arid uh, desert environment, <clears throat> not conducive or suitable. So this reminds me about several verses in the Bible about the devil himself. In the book of Job, perhaps the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, you remember the story about Job's trials and tribulations? In chapter 1, we read this. One day, angels, that's good spirit beings, demons are bad spirit beings. One day, angels, good spirit beings, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, means adversary, another name for the devil, also came and joined with them. So the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Remember, he had been in one of the higher angels. He rebelled because he wanted to be like God. You can't be like God and not be God. And there's only one God. And so he got kicked out of heaven, and guess where he landed? Right smack in the middle of a choir. No. Uh, <laughs> that's what one preacher said down south. Yeah, but that's not our choir. That's not our choir. No, no, no. It's not our choir. Uh, uh, usually it lands right smack in technical equipment, it seems like. That seems one place that the uh, devil. So anyway, he got kicked out of heaven and landed on earth. And um, now he, uh, of course, moves about. And uh, he appears here with the demons, uh, with the angels, excuse me, with the angels uh, who were with the Lord. And so God says to him, so where have you been, Satan? And he says this. He says, I've been roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. Now, no doubt that was a true statement. You see, Satan is a liar, but he doesn't lie all the time. Sometimes he does speak the truth. This is true. But you got to watch out for the mixture of lies and truth. The mixture of lies and truth. He twists and distorts to confuse and to mislead. And if you've been following anything that's going on in the world we live in today, a lot of distortion of truth, a lot of false mixed with some truth, and people get very confused. Who are you listening to? Know the word of God. God's word is truth. So, the devil doesn't always lie. Sometimes he says the truth. Remember the story in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say sometimes he just looks to cause question or confusion? So, God says to him, where have you been, Satan? He says, well, I'm roaming through the earth, going back and forth. Well, what's he looking to do going back and forth, roaming around? In the New Testament, uh, we have another verse about the devil. Starts off by saying this, be self-controlled and alert for your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. You need to resist him, standing firm in the faith. So the devil, busy fellow that he is, I know one preacher said to this lady, she always had something good to say about everybody. He said, you know, you probably, sister, would say something good about the devil. She said, well, he's a busy fella. He's a busy fella. <laughs> he is. He's a busy fella. Causing a lot of mischief. Going around the earth, looking who he may devour. And notice the positive things we're told of how to deal with that. 
be self-controlled. Be self-controlled, standing firm in the faith. That's how you resist the devil and gain victory over him. That's the positive dealing with the negative. So, now the parable that we're discussing today. The evil spirit departs. It goes looking for another place. But it does not find something that is suitable. So it, the guy told me the other day, he changed himself. He has a new pronoun for himself, it. <laughs> it left the toilet seat up. No. no. <laughs> he called himself it. So that's his, our friends up the street. He always cracks me up. So it says, it, here, the evil spirit decides to return to where it had been. When it arrives, it finds a place unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. So after having gone away, couldn't find a place, decides, I'll go back where I was. And lo and behold, he finds that place hard. Unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Now let's, let's delve into this for a moment and discover what the teaching of Jesus intends for us to take away from this parable. Remember, parables always have a major point or take away. Merely getting rid of something bad is not enough. Merely getting rid of something bad or evil is not enough. You can clean it up, you can get rid of something, but the bad or the evil even though it's now nice and neat in order and swept and put in order and clean, good is not good enough. Why is that? Because what you've done is you've created an empty space. And this forms a vacuum, a welcoming situation for the return of what was removed and gotten rid of. And into this empty, welcoming space comes back the bad or the evil, along with more bad and evil, leaving the person worse off than at first. Now let me read that again. An empty space forms a vacuum, a welcoming situation for the return of what was removed or gotten rid of. And into this empty, welcoming space comes back the bad and evil with even more bad or evil, leaving the person worse off than at first. How many times how many times have we seen this replicated? Far too many. Far too many. It's because people don't realize the risk they're taking by simply getting rid of something that's bad, but leaving a void, creating a vacuum. What's needed is to fill the space, our hearts, with something good. Fill or occupy a space, life, with something good, not leaving it empty. Even if you are uh, looking to just uh, empty out things and uh, clean things up and neat things up, put things in order, that's not good enough because you've created this vacuum that I mentioned. In the book of Philippians, we have an appropriate verse, I think, to share at this point. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Greek word there is a uh, military term, guard, garrison. The peace of God, which comes through the Holy Spirit, guards our hearts. So the empty space is now filled with the peace of God. And that keeps out the bad. So then he goes on to say this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So those are the positive things you need to fill the void with. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit giving us those things that guards and garrisons our hearts for bad things back in. So, it's not enough just to get rid of the bad, but you created a vacuum, an empty space, welcoming place for the bad or the evil to indeed 
come back. So now that we made that point, let's uh, talk about, let's get real practical here, where the rubber meets the road. And let's talk about some things that uh, people deal with that we even know about from our own experience or from people that we know. The bad or the evil that is in people's lives and hearts that uh, attempt to get rid of, but we need to replace with something better. Number one is drugs. Number one I'm going to talk about is drugs, and one of the drugs that we hear so much today about is fentanyl, killing a lot of people. 100,000 people a year have been dying in the United States from drug overdose, mostly from fentanyl. That is the equivalent, my friends, of 300 people a day. Can you imagine an airliner crashing with 300 people a day? Every day, an airliner with 300 people crashing. Every day. Now, if that airliner went down once or twice, the FAA would show up to do an investigation. Where is the government response with this catastrophe that is going on? Oh, the border is safe. The border is not safe. That's the number one issue. Secure where it's coming in from. Number two is to address the the need because if there's if there's a if there's a people make it people make a need and somebody says oh because there's this uh, interest and there's this need somebody's got to find a way to make some money from that and that's where the drug dealers come in. So just simply securing the border is not enough. You got to deal with. The, the void that's in people's lives that they're trying to fill with drugs. And that's where pure religion, needing Jesus, spiritual things come into play. You can't just get rid of the bad. you got to fill it with something better, something good. So drugs, number one, bad things that people need to get rid of, but need to find something to replace that emptiness or void in their lives causing them to look for something outside of themselves to bring some happiness or whatever else that they feel is missing. And number one is drugs. Remember, one of the old drugs is still alcohol. Still alcohol. The big difference between alcohol is one in ten people that drink become alcoholics. Nine out of ten people that use drugs become addicts, addicts. That's the difference. But it's still a very dangerous drug. Drugs, fentanyl, Heroin, cocaine, mar marijuana. Can you get, we, states make, some states make it legal while it's a federal crime. How do you figure that? Does that make sense? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me. Anyway. Um, another, another bad is pornography. One little click on one of your devices, there is trash. And uh, a lot of young people, people of all ages, get sucked into that. Why? Because pornography and sex has, has, a, has something to do with our own brain. And there's, there's this uh, chemical reaction. It's the same with, with uh, addictions. You're not only dealing with a bad habit, you're dealing with um, a, a chemical situation going on in the brain that you have to address. You have to address that. And so with pornography and sex, with drugs and alcohol, there's, there's beside bad habits, there you need to replace what is the, the chemical that's involved with that. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm leaving preaching and getting into meddling here, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we have a legal drug that is called caffeine. And, uh, you know, some years ago when I was at the village, we had this uh, coffee set up there, and you, whenever I was walking back to see some of my staff back there, I walked through the coffee room. So I'm drinking a lot of coffee. And I saw this one guy one day. He's like shaking like this. I said, gee, boy, you say you must drink six or seven cups a day. He said, I'll sp spill more than that. I'll spill more than that. <laughs> That's a joke. So anyway, uh, I got invited to preach at the Harbor Church up on Block Island. And uh, you remember her name, Donna, Donna, Donna Corey. Donna Corey. Also had a home up in uh, Island. She invited me to preach, and I was looking forward to Block Island, nice place, in Block Island, and the Harbor Church there. Uh, 
so we stayed in her house. She house there on the southwest side of the island. She had like about a 200 degree view of the ocean. Unbelievable, unbelievable home. And she had a reception for us that night uh, with some of our friends. Uh, so uh, you had, she had coffee. The next morning, she had coffee made. She didn't, it was decaf coffee. <laughs> I didn't know that. So I had my morning coffee, and by the time we got to church, I started to get this migraine headache, like a migraine headache. And I got to, I mean, it was, I could barely think, but I had to preach. And it was a, it was a caffeine, caffeine, you know, I didn't have my caffeine that morning. So I said to myself, I got to, I got to cut out on this caffeine because uh, that, that's a, that's a legal drug. That's, you know, we all, we got coffee back. We got the decaf in the regular cat, the calf back there. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I just point this out that uh, the chemical, chemical situation there, uh, you have to address with drugs and with pornography and sex. Now, here's another thing. Gambling. Gambling. You know, the Indians up here getting their uh, revenge. <laughs> One of my favorite cartoons, it shows that uh, here's Columbus with his sea, three ships, and he's standing in the front of one of the ships, and here's uh, two Indians in a canoe. <laughs> and uh, the little word says, the casino, it's over there. <laughs> and the caption of it is, why did Columbus discover America? Why did Columbus come to America? Now, Columbus, uh, while he was sailing for the Spanish, was actually Italian. I don't know about you, but I, some Italians I know, they would bet on cockroaches. They would bet anything, anything that moves. Anything that moves. I'm telling you, this is what one of them confessed to me. Our friend, our friend Joe, you remember Joe? You, anything that moves, they would have a bet on. You know, listen, so... Uh, the, the house always wins. I don't understand this. The house always wins. So well, you're hoping to beat the house? Um, I, I don't get that. Uh, you know, years ago, I used to play cards. And uh, at least with, with the cards, uh, there was some, there was some uh, uh, not just luck. For instance, I, I, when, back in college, odd nights, didn't have a date, you know, what else? You play cards, you know? So I, I discovered something, that people always, bet, as the evening goes along by, the kitty gets bigger. So there's some skill involved in, in, in poker or whatever. So it gets a little bit bigger. So I would purposely get caught bluffing early in this. So near the, near the end of the evening, when I nearly had it, really a good hand, they said, oh, he's bluffing. He's a bluffer. Well, it cost them to find out. But there was at least some skill in that. But with the, the machines and that stuff, it's just, it's it all rigged up. The house is, they're doing pretty well. And, and people don't show up at the casino, say, I'll bring in $50, $100 for a night of entertainment. That's not the problem. I can tell you there's people that go through all their savings, start stealing, stealing stuff from relatives and selling it, pawning it, and, and it, losing jobs over it. And it's really, uh, you know, uh, having a casino in Britain, all it does is cannibalize a lot of uh, other restaurants and things in the area. So not a good thing, gambling. Um, and, but but what's, why do people, because they're looking for the rush. <laughs> chink, 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 I don't know, whatever. And uh, there's uh, something there. So um, getting rid of the bad is not enough. You've got to fill it with something good find something good. I once said to my son uh, some years ago, uh, you need to find some habit or hobby, hobby, some hobby that you enjoy that's, that's beneficial. You know what he's into now? Hiking. He's all over Connecticut hiking. Larry Peaks, he comes back with these incredible sunsets. He takes pictures of he's, he's in hiking. He's now two years, almost two years sober. So that's a very good thing. Find something good to give you a rush. Jesus, I need Jesus. That's, that's, a, that, that's the best replacement of a drug that I know of. I know. And uh, our gentlemen that meet here on, Wednesday, uh, on Thursday nights for the AA meeting, they always end, stand around and pray the Lord's Prayer together. 
because the higher power is Jesus. That's the higher power. So uh, what else can I pick on here? Um, <laughs> other bad things. Um, spending and the overuse of credit. Because, you know, the, uh, remember the, the, the couple the, the, in the garden and they saw the apple? The more they looked at that apple or fruit or fig or whatever it was, the more they looked at it, the better it, it got. So uh, merchandisers are always going to package stuff to make it look good. And so you're going to be tempted to buy it just because it looked good. Now, I know I've had some experience with this, you know. i got enough clothes to fit out an army. Uh, and so I finally got to tell myself, I, had to, I don't need that. If I go, if I go um, what's the term here, uh, recreational shopping. Remember Tammy Faye? <laughs> Tammy, rec recreational shopping. You're always going to see something. And we got our houses full of stuff. And, you know, a lot of times it's putting on the credit card. On the credit card. And the number one uh, violator of all this is the federal government. $6.8 trillion budget has been proposed. The problem with that is it's not $6.8 trillion of revenue. It's putting it on the grandkids, let them pay it off. Eventually, what's going to happen? We're either going to have an economic collapse or they're going to devalue money. And that means you're 300,000 in uh, the, the IRAs is going to be 150,000. Sooner or later, the chickens are coming home to roost on spending and uh, what's associated with more stuff. And with the government, it's more free stuff. For a lot of people, it's just more stuff. Uh, how are those New Year's resolutions doing? You know, you're going to get rid of things. You're going to neaten up the house, so to speak, the house. Um, number one resolution, or number one and two, diets and going to the gym. Number one and two resolutions, New Year's resolutions. I'm going to lose weight. Well, unless you change your eating habits, it ain't going to happen. So you, gotta, you are what you eat. That's 80%. You can exercise. Exercise is good. And we see a lot of people, that I say, that at the gym in January. A whole lot of people... That, where are, they, where are they at the end of February or March? All of a sudden, they're not, they're not, they're not there uh, because they don't keep following through with their intentions. New Year's resolutions. You not only replace the bad, you got to come up with something good to replace whatever bad that you're looking to get rid of and fill it with something better. Replacing bad with good. That's, I think, the lesson of this parable, the parable of the haunted house or the empty house or the man's final condition is worse than the first. I believe this is the parable, and I think the teaching of this parable is exactly that. We want to replace the bad with something good. That is going to leave you in a better condition than you were before, rather than being worse than the first. Let's have a hymn at this time before our joys and concerns, but a prayer first. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this little teaching of Jesus about the evil spirit that departs but then came back. May we gather the wisdom from it that Jesus intended for us that we need to replace bad with something good. And, of course, the greatest good is the Lord and spiritual things, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, true Christian fellowship, to enable us indeed to be all that you intend for us to be, free from some of the bad and evil things that are very much a part of our lives and even from our own so help us to take to heart this parable today in our lives this week as we go forward. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before our joys and concerns is number 378 in the hymnal. Let's stand together and sing, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. 378. <laughs>
old story, always new though when we hear it. I have an empty page. <laughs> <laughs> Who is going to be first today to share? Well, I love hands. <laughs> I would request prayers for my friend Kathy. Her mother um, had a fall and is in the hospital. And her granddaughter is sick as well. So it's like both ends of the generations. Um, they really need prayers. All right. I would like to uh, definitely ask for prayers for uh, Anthony. Actually, more prayers for the doctor than for Anthony. <laughs> really, sedate him well. <laughs> Make sure his hands are steady and true, so uh, Anthony uh, comes back to us a whole person. Amen. 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 Oh, now Anthony wants a retort. <laughs> Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank all the members of the church for all their continued support and everything. Um, I want to prayers for Glenn Warmy, uh, Chris Matola, and um, Peter Ferriel, all with their health issues that they're going through, along with mine. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, the support from the church, I feel like uh, Jesus, like the fattened cow that's going, you know, going to be the sacrifice because... Oh. I go from one appointment to eat to another appointment to eat to another appointment to eat. And it's all different people that have been fattening me up, you know, almost for the bill, <laughs> which I do realize our members, their heart is in food, you know. And, uh, and last night I came to visit Carl, um, you know, to see someone else that has a desire to do something, which... Again, the members of our church are, are pretty amazing here. Um, I feel the love more than I feel the fear, mm. which I should be feeling fair. And I'm like, I'm at the end. This operation tomorrow, I can't wait. You know, right. like, um, I've progressively gotten worse, but that's okay. You know, the healing is coming. And I feel through our members of our church and prayer, I feel that healing is, going, is coming. Thank you. Amen. We believe it. We believe it. Beatrice. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to start with saying thank you to God for everything, from protecting us all. And I ask for prayers for my daughter and her family. Big time prayers for me. And also prayers for my friend Gail that's still, in, still dealing with uh, breast cancer. And for this young lady that I know, I don't know, uh, but I met her friend, and her name is Chantel, and she needs a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. So let's pray for her, and of course also for Anthony. Thank you. Amen. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, we'd like prayers for Mary Jane Capola's brother, Tommy. He's in the hospital, and I understand he's not doing very well. So we'd like prayers for his healing. And just on the other note, I'd like safe travels, uh, prayers for safe travels for my daughter, Wendy, who's in Pennsylvania this weekend, miss her in church, um, that she's uh, there visiting her dad. So safe travels home for her. Good morning. I just want to say, uh, actually, I want to say that uh, one of my friends at the apartment building is in the hospital again with her heart, and I want to pray for her. Her name is Karen, um, and then also I want to pray for myself. And then also I want prayers for Tom. And then also for my other friend, Karen. 
Uh, speaking of travels, Joanne and I are going not to, going to be around for Easter. We are going to be in California. Um, this is a situation for a memorial service for her father who passed away two years ago, and because of COVID and stuff, the family didn't feel they could do anything. But the weather out there hasn't been really good. <laughs> yeah. So prayers for us for safety and uh, for all those people. Take these to our Lord and God. <clears throat> and I have another funeral tomorrow. I had one last Wednesday, so I just uh, pray that I can be a comfort to people as well as uh, sharing a word of hope. So, <clears throat> yes, we're praying for Anthony's very quick recovery and for that doctor and the father's mercy. Everybody else, all these other concerns. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of prayer, that we're able to speak to you, the God, the creator, the sustainer of all the world and universes, that you uh, care about and invite us to pray, to speak to you, not only to inform you because you already know of all these things, but uh, when we pray, we're expressing faith in you, that your ability to not only hear but also to hear an answer, and we always have the confidence that uh, while we pray for this or that, you know the best, and what is the best in the long run, and so we always uh, pray with that disclaimer that uh, you know what is best, and we give thanks in advance for not only hearing, but for answering. <coughs> so, we close this time of prayer by praying, this prayer your son taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for now and forever. Amen. <coughs> our parting hymn is number 373, if you want to follow along, or the verses are number one in the bulletin as we stand and sing. parable was about sowing the seed, scattering, broadcasting the seed. That's what we did when we mailed us out to 5,257 homes. And you remember also in that parable, the farmer comes along and he plows or he breaks up the soil so the seed is able to penetrate. So we've been breaking up the soil down here on the West Shore. Uh, how do we do that? Tag sales. The community tag sales making friends and building up the grounds, all right. The Halloween treats that we give out, the hundreds and hundreds of people that come by, children of all ages. Uh, the Christmas Bazaar and the Cookie Walk, also making a lot of friends. Um, what else am I leaving out? Easter egg, Easter egg hunt, yes, yes, we can't forget the Easter egg hunt. How are those eggs coming, Paula? They're ready to be filled. Have your coffee and we've got work to do. Be, be. <laughs> okay, now be careful if Greg helps to fill. Uh, yeah, so one for them, one for me, one for them, one for me. 
the mini musical. Yeah, last year we had 100 people here for that. We had 80 or so here for Christmas. So these are the things we've been doing to break up the soil. We're now scattering the seed. Okay, so now those of you that live in this neighborhood, you agree you got your card. Uh, I'm encouraging people to, um, you know, put the card somewhere on the refrigerator door or whatever else, that, you know, people travel by on a frequent basis. If you would like to have a card to give to somebody, we just happen to have some extra ones. Dave got us some more cards. So I'm standing over here shaking hands. If you want a card or two, now if you want to mail it, you want to mail it, you got to put a postage stamp over that permit there. Okay, you got to put a, okay, if you want to mail it, so stick it out. Or if you want to hand it to somebody, just put their name on it and hand it. So I have some extras here. I'll be at the door. If you want one of these for your house, one or two to share with somebody, I encourage you to do that. Okay? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon our food and fellowship now that we're about to enjoy. Also, our outreach this week and especially for the wind gathering next Sunday. Egg hunt and then the musical. And we ask and pray these things all in our Lord's name.